All right, we are live. David, thank you so much for joining us for our first Wines of Prestige tasting. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you, and we're so excited to kick things off with you. So since uh, most of our members, I would suspect, know who you are, all of our attendees are from the U.S., and, and many of them have obviously been to Napa, but why don't you give us a little bit of a background on who you are, and then we can dive into talking about Senegal Estate Winery. That's great. Uh, well, I would not assume that everybody is familiar with me and my project. Uh, there's over a thousand wineries in Napa County alone, and I'm, I'm one of that. And so um, every time, even longtime visitors to Napa come, uh, we, we always get new people exposed to our project. So we are a small boutique estate in the foothills of the Mayakama Mountains. The Mayakamas are the mountains that run the southwest side of Napa Valley. And uh, our 30 acre property is in the foothills of those mountains coming down into um, kind of a, the westerly uh, flatlands. And it's a historical property that uh, has been here since 1879. So a very, a very historical place. Uh, the home that is uh, my family's um, has been here since, since that date, uh, continuously planted to vine since 1881. So tons of history. Um, as is the case with every old property in Napa, there's a very interesting story behind every prior owner, um, including a phase of time where it went into disrepair during prohibition. So very beautiful property uh, that um, I bought and brought back to its original glory in 2013. Uh, this is a family father and son project. And uh, we've had a, a great time collaborating um, as uh, father and son in turning the uh, barn that was here on the property into a state-of-the-art winemaking facility. I'm actually in one of the salons right now that is part of that uh, build out. Uh, behind me, I have my own private collection. So uh, a lot of interesting stories and in, in, in working with my father and bringing this, this about. Um, so we're almost to our 10 year mark of being in the business and still small boutique up and coming brand, but we're, we're getting some great recognition and accolades having just received uh, some of our first 100 point scores. So congratulations. I see some questions coming in. Um, definitely, definitely want to start with the Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so I can I can walk you through that right now. This well, is actually, tell you what, David. Why don't we hold on the wine for a bit? We'll get right. to the tasting in a moment. I know there's a, a few other questions that we'll we'll get to, and then we'll dive right in. But so you were mentioned that you got the whole estate going with your father, and obviously, well, not obviously, people may not know that you and your father. Uh, uh, owned and, and, and managed Costco for a very long time. I don't know if you're still involved there, but so working together with your father in that context, uh, whose idea was it to come over into the wine world? How did that come about? Uh, firstly, just to, to kind of set the record straight, uh, when Costco first opened, it was a family business. My father as founder and my me as 11th employee, uh, you know, were part of the founding team. There were other people certainly involved. Um, now it's 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 been on the Nasdaq Public Exchange since 1986. So, every there's a lot of people that own a small part of Costco at this point, including big institutional investors. But um, yeah, so how I got into the wine business or decided to get into it, uh, it was something he and I, my father uh, and I, discussed for many years as of interest. Um, one, because of passion for wine, but also for to see if he and I could, as a small business, could collaborate well together. Both two very strong-willed, opinionated people who knew a lot about consumer products. And uh, we kind of went back and forth for about 10 years trying to decide upon exactly how we wanted to do it and where we wanted to do it. At one point, I was talking about doing something in eastern Washington in the Red Mountain area. Um, because I thought Napa, it was already a little bit played out, uh, but we settled upon Napa. Um, that kind of coincided with life change for me in that I had uh, just prior to that uh, remarried and fell in love with this wonderful woman and decided that it was the right time to, to pursue that passion for wine and start the winery and, and start a new family down here in Napa. 
Oh, that's great. That's a nice story. How you, uh, I mean, uh, wine is always a, an important part of people's lives. So it seemed to, to dovetail nicely with, uh, with how yeah, you it was, were you know. Yeah, it was equal, equal parts passion and uh, uh, left brain rationale. Um, <laughs> You know, I did get into the business and, and, and it's become much more of a vocation and mm. less of a hobby uh, than I had originally expected. But I, I still love it and, and, and enjoying uh, the challenge of it. That's one of the funny things. I've spent one harvest working at a winery and you think before you go, it's going to be this romantic thing. And, you know, it's I don't know, you just envision that it's going to be um, glamorous or or. or uh, you know, easy in some sense, but no, it's hard work. You're lugging pumps, you're cleaning barrels. <laughs> it is uh, not for the faint of heart. So it definitely has the vocational element, as you say, but also a lot of fun and a lot of passion. For sure. No, it's, um, that's probably what drew me to it. In addition to the love for wine itself is it's one of the few um, cottage industries that I literally own the quality that, that mm -hmm. is delivered in the finished product all the way from the soil. So it's every aspect of it I control totally vertically, vertically integrated. And so I, I find that part of it very interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's um, a lot of winemakers I speak to, they say that the wine is made if it starts or, or at, least, at least starts, if not is made in the vineyards, right? So obviously the the grapes are quite important. So on that note, let's actually dive into the wines and the, the soils and the terroirs of the different wines that you make. So let's talk a little bit about that and sort of your farming practices, how you approach the actual viticulture of your wines. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're, our estate is certified organic and uh, we practice uh, sustainability such that we are a fish friendly farm. Uh, we have a very large lake on the property. So it's uh, probably the prize jewel of the actual estate. And so for all of those reasons, we, we really like to protect the ecosystem, but we also think some of those choices manifest in making superior wine. Um, we do some biodynamic practices as well, although we are not considered a biodynamic vineyard, um, mm -hmm. but we have uh, kind of identified certain elements of the biodynamic process that we are we think are important to producing better quality wine grapes. Such as what, like what would you, what do you do? We do soil amendments with teas that we create. So we'll, we'll, we'll amend the soil with different types of tea, fermented teas that we produce that we think actually um, is very beneficial. We don't harvest or we don't farm according to the lunar calendar. And we don't have a ram's head buried in the northwest corner of the vineyard. Those are a couple of the things that the biodynamic folks feel mm -hmm. are very important and are part of what differentiates. But um, so we've kind of landed in that compromise place where honoring some of the ideas that we think are compelling and that um, add quality. And so how much time would you say you personally spend in the vineyard? Are, are you there in your rubber boots a lot of the time or more on the in the winery and on the business side? Uh, I'm on both sides of the business. Um, you know, at this point in our own estate and the vineyards that we source from, the size that we've become, even though we're still small, um, it's our activities in the vineyard are more managerial, like observing the progress and the development and the health of the vines, the development of the grape clusters, and making farming choices. It's not so much out there with a hoe and a rake. Um, you know, we're to produce the amount of wine that we're talking about uh, that we make here, even as a small project, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of acres of, of vineyard. So no, I'm, I'm not doing a lot of farming or picking at this point. But you have your shears if you ever need them <laughs> to go help out, I'm sure. Well, absolutely. I mean, every, every block of every vineyard that we, um, that we have, you know, we're, we're analyzing those grapes and pretty much, especially this time of the year, we're out there looking at them on a daily basis and trying to evaluate things to do. Like, for example, two weeks ago when we had the extreme heat spike, um, we use uh, shade cloth, which is a way of prov providing a, basically a canopy to diffuse some of the extreme sunlight and heat that uh, hits the vines in the afternoons, which uh, is uh, hel helps the vines to not get too stressed. Interesting. Well, we'll, we'll um, 
we'll ask you for a report on this vintage in a moment, but just turning from viticulture to the winemaking itself, is there anything particular about how you actually make the wines? Are you using a lot of uh, natural fermentation and, and uh, in, uh, indigenous yeasts? Are you using inoculation? Are you using barrels? What you, what's your winemaking approach? Yeah, um, you know, there's there's only a handful of people in Napa that are actually using natural yeast to ferment. Um, and the truth of it is most of the natural yeast that's in the air um, is introduced by people inoculating. So <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, so we do indeed inoculate and we use uh, types of, of yeast that um, are hardy enough to, um, because the only, the, the main thing is a put you at risk of making a poor wine is if you get a fermentation that sticks and mm -hmm. it doesn't convert from sugars to alcohol. And if you have to restart a, a fermentation, that's, that's really, really bad for the wine. So, um, so we do inoculate. We, um, in terms of oak, we, we use exclusively 100% French oak for our Senegal wines. Um, and we source from about 15 different coopers. So only the best coopers and only the, 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 the wood from the best forests. We do believe that the, the aging process is a very big part of the winemaking uh, recipe. And so uh, we're, we're very mindful of not only just using good raw material, but then also uh, marrying up the right grapes and the right wines uh, or mini wines in our cellar with the right woods to achieve the desired outcome we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And are you fairly involved in the in the tasting and the blending? And it, I don't know if you guys actually make any blends right now, but are you involved in, in the, um, the final product decisions or do you tend to leave that to your winemaker? No, I'm very involved in that. Yeah. So we, we have uh, three base, three uh, blending um, and kind of wine evaluation um, milestones. One is what we call our primary blending or primary evaluation. Uh, it, and it usually happens in uh, February of, you know, like this year, the 2022 harvest will happen next February. And that's really determining what we have from the seller is AAA quality, what's AA quality, what's A. And if, if the chance that we have anything that's B quality or less, we will not actually use that wine and we will um, sell it and, and to others who don't have the, the quality standards that we do. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, everything that we make is either AAA to A rated. And it's because of our, uh, we, our unique approach we take to um, measuring and, and analyzing phenolic development, not just in the grapes in the field, but also the grapes upon receipt and the juice and wine during the, the fermentation process. So a lot of data, amazing amount of data involved in winemaking. I was going to say, you sound like you're quite the high tech operation. You're giving inventory a run for our money. We thought we were the tech company here. <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, because we micro farm and micro ferment, that's part of our, our strategy. You know, we'll have in any given year, we'll have, I think this year, over 80 separate lots that we'll make. So we make very small pick decisions uh, and we bring in anywhere from two tons at a time to 20 tons at a time. And um, usually airing to the smaller side. And so what that does is it creates basically a spice rack for us to build um, in the cellar. So then we can evaluate those different wines to figure out how they best marry up. But by doing it that way, you can then ensure that you're picking the grapes at their, their optimum phenolic development. Mm -hmm. Which maybe for those who maybe aren't familiar with the, the term pheno phenolic development or phenolic ripeness, do you want to just maybe explain that quickly? Sure, sure. There's base, There's two different types of ripeness to wine. Uh, one is your basic chemistry that speaks more to bricks. Um, you know, like with any fruit you leave on the counter in your kitchen, over time that, that fruit will begin to oxidize and break down. Um, and, and, and usually the sugars will increase with that. Well, that, that certainly happens with grapes, 
But in addition to that, not necessarily on a parallel path, the grapes de develop phenolically while they're still on the vine. So there's this constant battle that occurs where you're, you're competing with the fruit ripening and sugar sugars ripening, but the, typically the phenolics, the, the color pigment, the anthocyanins, the tannins, all of that develops at a different rate to the sugar ripening. And so it, it, it's, there's a, a real uh, knack in an art form to figuring out the right time to pick because you don't want to pick the fruit when it's too ripe because too ripe of fruit will ultimately manifest in uh, wine that's too high in alcohol because the sugars are what convert to alcohol. So um, it's uh, always kind of walking that fine edge between uh, chem chemistry ripeness and phenolic ripeness. The alchemy of it, the magic of it. Well, before we dive into tasting, because I think everyone is pretty keen to get into the wines, why don't we start with our first sweepstakes question? So we have four sweepstakes questions laid out for you. Uh, three of them will result in the lucky winner getting an inventory hoodie, which I promise you is the most comfortable hoodie you will ever have. I see Jared is here in the mix. He has won one in a prior tasting, and I think you will attest to this. Uh, and then the fourth lucky winner is going to win the tour and tasting at Senegal, uh, which is for, for six people valued at $900. It was a very generous donation from Senegal and from David. So thank you for that. And uh, we'll save a good question for the end for that one. But let's start with one of the maybe easier questions. David, do you have the questions in front of you? Do you want to choose one for that's worthy of a hoodie or should I pick from the list? Well, I don't know what the rest of the, where, you, you, I have four questions. So, so you have, it seems like you have more no, okay. I had four. We had four. Okay. Okay. Um, you want to pick one of the four? Well, let's let's do the key. Oh, it's actually, you know what? Before you do, I should I should um, tell people the process, the rules. <laughs> so, everybody, when uh, David asks the question, please pull up the chat and then write the answer in, but do not hit enter and send. And as soon as David finishes asking the question and says go. Uh, well, he'll give you a minute to, to think about it, but uh, after a couple seconds, when he sets go, hit send, and whoever is the first person to get it right in the chat will win the hoodie. So that's just the easiest way to do it. It's kind of hard for people to shout out in this format. So sorry, David, over to you. Like a game show. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is, those of you who have a bottle with you, you know what the label looks like, but see if I can get the glare to go away. Here is the label of the wine, Senegal, Sauvignon Blanc. So the key, the question to you is the key. What is the significance of this key? Mm. Tough. I can almost hear everybody quickly Googling. <laughs> but we'll see if Jared, whenever you feel like they've had Jared, enough time, you say go. Jared uh, says that the, the, the hoodie is so comfy. <laughs> All right. Okay, so it's my, I get to decide when we've allocated enough time. I feel like we need Jeopardy music there. Oh, wow. I can't okay, play. all right. So um, fire away, you guys. Am I waiting Am I waiting for someone to write something in the dialogue box or what am I supposed to do? Yeah, everyone should have written it and hit enter. Oh, Jared says the key to the front door. So uh, the key to the front door of the original property. Oh, interesting guess. Any other entrance? Actually, you know what? I'm just realizing this doesn't send to the whole group. It just sends to the panelists. So you guys are welcome to enter your, your uh, responses whenever you have them, since they won't uh, tip off the rest of the group. Any other guesses out there? Otherwise, Jared will be winning potentially a second hoodie, which I'm sure he will give to his wife. <laughs> okay, no other answers. David, do you want to tell us what it was? And if Jared was right, is it the key to the... Original friend. Oh, we have somebody I think who came in the Q&A. Just wait one moment. The grape. Mm. The grape. The grape. I'm I, cannot, sure. I, I cannot see that. that, that no, that, that came in the Q&A. Um, I think that was Richard. If you want to pop that into the chat instead of the Q&A, then we'll be able to see it. Well, I think audibly I heard the, the response 
and I, I'm going to have to give this one to Jared. Uh, technically, it's the, what we refer to as the key to the estate, but more specifically, it is actually the key to the historical home. And it's this actual key that we keep in a shadow box in the tasting room. And we kind of celebrate the story and celebrate the key as an artifact. And it's a great story. And Jim Peterson had the same answers, but a different way. So I'm not sure the two of you can fight over who gets that hoodie. <laughs> I think, I think um, we already have one, Jared. Maybe we should give it to Jim. That is true. Jared, if uh, you did officially win, but I think uh, you have one. Yeah, so we'll let Jim have that one. Jim, congratulations. You won yourself an inventory hoodie, and we'll be sending those around after the event. Jared, you still have a chance to win the tour and tasting though, so, so don't despair. Uh, all right, David, let me turn it over to you. Let's dive into our first wine, and then you can walk through all of the wines at your leisure and invite questions as they come. For anybody who would like to throw questions at David as we go through, please, uh, we welcome them. You can drop them into the chat or into the Q&A, and I'll feed them to him. And uh, let's get going with the wines. Fantastic. Well, once again, uh, the, the three wines that we selected for today is the first is the, the Sauvignon Blanc, the 2020 uh, Senegal Sauvignon Blanc, which is um, some of the grapes come from the estate and some of the grapes come from a good grower partner in Napa Valley, uh, the Gamble Ranch, which is in Yountville. This wine is a, a blend of Sauvignon Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc Mosquet clone with the touch of Semillon. It's po possibly our most crafted uh, artisanal wine. Um, and it, it's, it's fermented in oak barrels, it's the standard cooper barrels that you coop uh, the agent. And, um, and then it's actually Sir Lead Botanage, um, the, the dead yeast leaves uh, for about two weeks after fermentation. And then it, it's aged in those oak barrels for a full 10 months, which is very unusual for Sauvignon Blanc. Um, those of you who have the wine with you, I, that, that botanage and that aging imparts upon the Sauvignon Blanc that, that creme brulee mouthfeel and that weight, which is a, a signature element to our wine. Um, uniquely, uh, the, the, the bouquet is, um, is very floral and the taste of the wine is, uh, I think, is more stone fruit than citrus or grass, which is um, once again, a unique style for Napa and very distinctive from like a New Zealand style Sauvignon Blanc. Um, lastly is the acidity you'll, on the back of your palate. You'll notice that it's, it's a bone dry wine and it's very, very bright, very acidic. So enjoy that. Um, we have a question on that for you, David. First, just a quick question. From me, so with the barrels in which you're fermenting the wine and then aging them, I'm assuming those are those are older barrels because you're not imparting too much oak to the wine, correct? There is a touch of new used. It's about 30% new wood and 70% neutral oak. Neutral is a term used for, for barrels that have been exposed to wine before, so reused, if you will. But that neutral uh, new composition is, like I said, uh, very much a part of the, the winemaking recipe. Mm, interesting. Well, we have a question here. Do you commission the grapes from your supplier and are there any special criteria that you require? On here. Uh, that came in the q and I don't know if you can see the Q&A. You may not be able to see the Q&A, David. Yes. Do I, do I commission the grapes from your supplier? Um, we, we have a, a, a grower that we work with. It's a third party, um, but he actually farms to our specifications. So it's handled like a long-term lease contract to where we determine, we don't determine the, the, the vineyard uh, rows necessarily or the, or the plantings because that's already been established, but we chose to work with them on the basis of it supporting our program. But we make everything from disking decisions to soil amendment decisions to pruning decisions and certainly picking decisions. So we pretty much have the same level of control to the farming practices 
with these growers that we work with as we do with our own estate. Great. And then we did have one more question from Tiana that came through. It's not necessarily about the Sauvignon Blanc, but the question is, how do you decide what wines to make? That's a good question. Well, that's, um, there's two different ways uh, to I settle upon the assortment. Uh, firstly, um, because the program and, and the project is very much an expression of the place that is St. Helena and the estate location, uh, the cornerstone of our program is Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon. Those two grapes are the varietals that are most conducive to this particular microclimate. So um, it would make only make sense that those would be our two flagship wines. In addition to that, um, I would say the assortment has really evolved to being a combination of what are, is my personal style and my personal taste and what am I drawn to? What is excites me? What's ex, what excites Ryan Knoth, the winemaker? And what we think that the market has an appetite for. Um, and then the last leg of the stool would be, you know, it's gotta be something that we think is economically viable for us to, to buy the grapes and make the wine and to produce uh, a high quality wine that's uh, worthy of our name. So good criteria. Good answer. Well, we have another question from Jim, just a clarification on the barrels. So he said, uh, you mentioned that the barrels are from the best forest and he was just confirming the country. You had mentioned all your barrels are French, right? Correct. Yes. All, all the barrels are French and, um, you know, we've, uh, we've experimented a little bit with American barrels. And we've experimented a little bit with Hungarian barrels. We think that there's potential for Hungarian barrels, but American barrels, um, just that the the um, the veining of the uh, the oak is just too wide, and it actually imparts too much wood uh, upon the wine. It, it's 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 uh, more of what the aging process you want to derive from that experience is micro oxidization, which kind of changes the, the complexity and the, the tertiary flavors and aromas of the wine and allows for more uh, binding of the wine with, with uh, the, the, the color pigments and the tannins. Um, so it's not really about wanting the wine to taste like wood, honestly. That's, that's generally, broadly speaking, a characteristic of, of lower quality wine. Mm. Yeah, you can... Uh tell when something has been made with oak extract. Well, Tiana also adds that the Sauvignon Blanc is absolutely delicious. So thank you, Tiana, for that. If anyone else has any impressions about the wine, we welcome those as well. Any thoughts? Uh, it is quite a, as David said, um, perhaps would you consider this your flagship, David, or would you say the Cabernet Sauvignon is more your flagship? Well, certainly, certainly the Cabernet Sauvignon is our flagship. It's more broadly distributed, uh, more widely recognized. Our, our Cabernet uh, Sauvignon Reserve has got a pretty uh, robust secondary market for it. So, um, so yeah, I would say that that's probably our flagship. Yeah, great. Well, before we move on to the next wine, let's do another question. Let's give away another hoodie. I feel like Oprah. Hoodies for everybody. <laughs> so I'll leave you to pick a question. So I'll answer the question or ask the question rather in two different ways. Uh, or, or the two two acceptable responses to the question, and I think I actually gave away the answer in a uh, introduction. Um, either which was our first vintage of the project, or um, which how many years has the project been in existence? Mm. Mike very quickly answered. Well, wait, well, there is a way to send it to everybody. Mike, yeah. you figured it out. <laughs> I was going to wait for a couple of more responses. Is Are they in the Q&As? No, I don't think anyone else has sent in a response. If anyone else wants to take a stab, shoot them into the chat. <laughs> oh, Mike, that's okay. That was on me for the instructions. Jared has another answer, but doesn't need another hoodie. 
Well, should we find out if Mike was correct? Well, Mike is correct. So um, Mike is correct. It's, yeah, I can't, I can't let Jared corner the market here. Uh, <laughs> so He's this watching vintage, you do that. He's very this, intelligent. This vintage that we are in right now is our 10th vintage. Um, so I guess te technically 10 years would be uh, 2023. But um, yeah, so this is our 10th vintage. And um, I'm very proud to say as we've gotten larger, our, our wine just continues to get better and better. So I'm really thrilled with how we, as we've evolved, um, our skill and our mastery of our art has, uh, has uh, you know, continued to grow or sourcing better fruit or growing better grapes and we're certainly making significantly better wine. Great, well, congrats, Mike. That's a hoodie coming your way and you'll have to fight with Melissa over who gets to wear it. All right, let's move on to the next wine. Those of you who have the rosé, we have the 2021 uh, Grenache rosé that actually comes from Sonoma. Mm. So this is one of the wines that uh, uh, we've chosen to source elsewhere from oh. St. Helena, from Senegal Estate. And that's solely because Grenache is much more conducive to the cooler climate that is Sonoma. If we tried to grow this, this, um, this fragile grape here in Napa, it, it probably would um, shrivel up and, and, and die a very ugly death. So for us to make the quality of wine that we wanna make, we found a great partner that we've been working with for the last 10 years to, to help us with Grenache. Um, it's very traditional Provencal style of, of rosé, bone dry uh, Grenache, and um, it's quite unique uh, these days. Um, unfortunately, much of the rosé that's out there in the market is not single varietal, is blended by uh, cheaper grape varietals, and frankly made with quite a bit of residual sugar. So. Whenever you go to a restaurant or a wine shop and you find a subset list of dry rosé, that's the special stuff and that's what you want. Well, good tip. Let's taste so, it. Something else that people don't know or realize is that um, generally speaking, um, the Provencal style of wines have this much lighter kind of salmon color to them. Uh, but it being lighter in color doesn't necessarily mean it's of higher quality. Sometimes people perceive that. Um, there are some very high quality rosés that have a little bit more color pigment to them. So cheers to you, enjoying that glass of rosé. This is, this is our first inaugural vintage of the rosé, by the way, and what we typically use to greet people here at the estate. Uh, we had a couple of questions that came in the Q&A, David, that I'll just toss to you. Uh, the first was, how long do you keep wines in barrel? I think this was referring to the Sauvignon Blanc, but you can comment on any of the wines. And then the second question is, what is your target alcohol content? Again, you can comment on others. Yeah, it's it really varies by varietal. Um, you know, it's a couple, I, let's see, answer the first question first. Um, the Sauvignon Blanc age, is aged for 10 months uh, from, from, from harvest until bottling. And then the rosé is uh, really not aged much at all. I mean, we'll, we'll actually bottle the 2022 vintage sometime later this spring because um, it's, it's not really aged in oak at all. And it's really much more about the uh, the acid of the wine and, and the cl its clean, crisp taste. Um, our reserve, that will, depending upon the vintage, it varies from 22 months to 24 months. So that's our, our wine that we aged the longest. Okay. And then Next. the other question was alcohol. Target once, alcohol content, yeah. Yeah, that, that, once again, that varies greatly by varietal. Um, 
inherently California or Napa Valley specifically, because it is so hot and there's so many days of intense sunshine out here, it's a real challenge to keep the alcohol content down by way of contrast to Bordeaux or to Burgundy. Um, our Sauvignon Blanc is in the high 12, so like 12.8%, something like that. Let's see at the back of this vintage. Excuse me, no, actually, I stand to be corrected. It's 14%. Our, our Chardonnay is actually 13 and a half. And then um, our Cabernets, we try to consistently keep those right around 14.7, 14.8% alcohol. Um, we just feel like um, too much alcohol kind of gives, imparts upon the wine almost kind of a hot mouth finish. Um, and actually can take away from some of the, the subtleties of it. So what did you guys think of the rosé? You like the rosé? Jim would like to try it with some steak tartare, which I second that. Interesting. What would you pair this with, David? Um, probably not steak tartare, but yeah, I mean, that, yeah, sure. Anything raw would go well with the, with, uh, the rosé, I think. I, I was I was leaning more towards seafood or something like that, but yeah, absolutely. It's one of the nice things about rosé, it's pretty versatile when it comes to pairing. It is, and, and it's one of the wines I think that is, uh, when people think of rosé, they don't think of it as much as a food pairing wine as some of the other varietals. That's true, it's a patio crusher with your friends a lot of the time. Uh, all right, so before we move on to the Cabernet, let's do one more sweepstakes question for a hoodie. And then after we've done the Cabernet, we will do our grand prize and open up to the Q&A. So the last hoodie question. And this time, everybody, please uh, enter your answers. Let's do it the way we, we originally tried. Enter your answers. Make sure that you're sending it to panelists and attendees. And when David says go, hit send. Okay. So this last one, I don't even think, there, there's no way you would have up to know this and I don't think I mentioned it in my intro but we're best known for our Cabernet Franc it's not our flagship but we're best known for our Cabernet Franc our recent 100 point scores we got from Antonio Galoni and Jeb Dunnick were both on our Cab Franc and that Cab Franc is old vine so the question is what year was that old vine cab front planted? Oh, that's tricky. I don't know if that's something Google can easily tell people. So. I, don't think so. I don't think you can cheat and, and do a quick Google, Google search on that one. So waiting, it's open to the forum, waiting for answers to that question. Hmm. Oh, Michael. Well, Michael only sent it to the panelists, so that's okay. We'll, we'll... So I see Michael's guess is 1972. I think everybody can hit their, their uh, guesses into the whole group if you've that's typed a, it in. 1972 is a solid guess. 1964, 2017. That would make for a better story because that was my birth year. Um, ben Rodnicki says he knows the answer. <laughs> I would certainly hope so, Ben. Jim Peterson, 1880s. You might have to be a little more specific, Jim, than that. <laughs> Just take a guess, Jim. We're going to apply um, Price is Right rules, so I would say shoot lower. And then, oh, I think somebody Jared, might have Jared, Jared's chiming in. Mike, 97. Uh -huh. We have better participation on this question. This must be a more interesting question for you guys. I think I just missed, I, I gave poor directions on the first few. But uh, what, do you, what do you think, David? Is the answer in there somewhere or do we need to give people another moment? The answer is in there, but I'm, I'm actually kind of getting irritated that Jared is the one getting all the answers. Right. <laughs> 
Well, we'll Jared, talk to Jared about that after. What's the deal, Jared? Did you like bone up for this before the, the, the conference? <laughs> it's okay. Way to go, Jared. Apparently you did a little research on me before we got online. So the, the, the Cabernet Franc, is our old vine cap franc planted in 1982. So it's um, 44 years old and still kicking, which is, um, you know, certainly there's like old vines, Zinfandel, and, um, but generally speaking, it's unusual for uh, vines to, to continue to, they continue to live, but they don't continue to thrive to be productive, usually for 45 years. So it's quite unusual. Um, and part of that age actually adds to the character of the wine, which I think why the critics love it so much. Great. Well, tell you what, for that one, I think the closest person who didn't overshoot, if we're applying prices right rules, was actually Michael with 1972. So Michael, there is an inventory hoodie coming your way. That was a good guess. And with that, let's move to the cab. All right. So last but not least, this is our 2019 Spilek Series Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, with the, the Sauvignon Blanc that you've tried and now the Cabernet Sauvignon Blanc or the Cabernet Sauvignon, this is designated a cab sauv, but as most of you probably are aware that to market it as Cabernet Sauvignon, it's a Bordeaux blended wine. And so this is, uh, this particular vintage, um, because we vary it every year, it's 92% Cab, 4% Petit Bordeaux, 3% Merlot, 1% Malbec. So um, 20, 20 months of age in 100% new French oak, or 95% new French oak rather, and um, it's fermented in both steel and open top uh, Terenceau French uh, cuvee um, casks. So this is the wine we've become best known for. Um, in the United States, it's sold in 48 states. Um, we actively promote on um, Vivino, uh, there's a good community around the brand on uh, Delectable. We uh, have sold the wine into, I believe, 12 countries. And um, it's been showcased and featured at some of the best uh, restaurants in the country, including Thomas Keller's Per Se in New York. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, we're developing quite a name for ourselves with this wine in particular. So I invite you to, to pick up your glass. Firstly, give it a good swirl. You know, because of the, because of the way that we pick, because of the way that we make wine, because of the way that we age, um, our wines have a unique balance of acid and kind of concentrated fruit. It's plush and kind of um, hedonistic and enjoyable, but yeah, it still has tertiary aromas and tertiary flavors. And I think that's kind of our secret sauce is that that balance and that yin and yang of both of those things. It's become our house style and it's kind of representative of the place that is this foothills of the Maya Kamas. And um, we think it's, it's a great place for us to land in a world of Napa wines that are over extracted, over alcoholed and um, no, uh, low in acidity. So it's it's very unique. Well, for anyone who is enjoying this Cabernet or another Cabernet, I know we did have some people who had other bottles of Cabernet, whether the reserve or the estate. If you have any impressions to share, I see Jeff is having his 2016 Senegal reserve. Um, so... That's yeah, a couple of things I wanted to speak to on that. I mean, the different vintages, um, every year we make the wine, we do want to have a, con a continuity to our house style and have the wine be an expression of the place. Um, but we also want it to be an expression of the vintage as well, because there's a story there to be told also. So um, 
you know, I've had the good fortune since 2013 um, in the last 10 years, having more good vintages than bad. Um, you know, truth be told, the only catastrophic vintage we had was 2020 when there was smoke taint that was so prevalent throughout the area that we couldn't make any red wine at all. Uh, we chose not to, I should say. Some people have made 2020 uh, Napa wines and uh, the red, red wines of 2020, I would caution you on those if you find them out in the marketplace. But uh, broadly speaking, we've had many good vintages. Uh, probably 15 was uh, one of the hottest vintages. Uh, very, very hot vintage um, makes for uh, the wines uh, are a touch more rustic in style, uh, slightly higher um, alcohol content. Uh, but the, the Hell Mountain Cab, the 2015, um, uh, Hell Mountain is just beautiful wine, and uh, it actually happens to be my father's favorite wine. He really likes the Hell Mountain. That's the one Jared is having. So on that, how long would you say the aging window is for a wine like that, David, if Jared has another bottle tucked away? Well, all of the wines that we, all the, all the red wines we, we, we make, I should be more specific, um, uh, Robert Parker characterize them as wines that would not peak in their development for a full 10 years of cellaring. So, so let's say it's 2013, if you have a 2013, now would be a good time to, to start to enjoy that wine because it's probably not going to continue to improve and evolve anymore. Um, so I think that holds true with all of our wines. That's Robert Parker's point of view. My point of view would probably be most of the benefit that you're getting through aging is going to happen within the first three or four years. After four years, I'd say go for it uh, because there's more good wine to appreciate after that bottle. So Michael had asked for the 2014 cab, which he has, when is the peak for drinking? So you would say now is a good time to open that. <laughs> I, I would definitely say you should be drinking the 14 now. Yeah, don't don't wait any longer. Um, you know, you're you're gonna run out of cellar space and you're gonna run out of days to drink if you keep holding wine for 10 years. Some of that is the commercial side of me speaking too, right? Because you know, we in the wine business like wine to be drank, not wine to be collected under bright lights and 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 uh, celebrated as a collectible. We like we like people who drink wine, <laughs> or at least to replenish their wares if they do. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then the 2016, it sounds like Jeff, you're opening it at a great time, the reserve, because I'm assuming that would even have more stuffing. So now might be a good time to open that 16 reserve. Yeah, let me check my notes on 16, um, 16 reserve. Uh, don't think I pulled my notes on the 16 reserve. I remember the 16 reserve being a little bit more, um, a little bit more forgiving. There was quite a bit of rain in 16. I don't believe it was quite as hot. Um, I, I remember the yields being um, a little bit higher, but I remember it being really truly beautiful wine um, and, and a little bit more elegant than than six than fifteen rather. So I, I think I actually preferred the sixteen vintage over the fifteen vintage, but my personal style is more to uh, that more feminine style. Yeah, the more elegant. Interesting. Well, tell you what, we have uh, well eight minutes left. I'm sure if if David is okay, we can go a minute or two over. But let's ask our final question, the final sweepstakes question for the grand tour. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A and invite a few people to come up on, on stage, so to speak, to ask their question. So David, why don't you ask our last sweepstakes question? Absolutely. So the, the question here is what year was the, the ABA for St. Helena designated? Mm. This is a hard one. So we'll give everybody a... You have to go deep deep in the records to, to, to figure this one out. And Ben, you don't get to answer this one because I'm assuming you would know as well. <laughs> so 
So I think this is probably going to be a, a guess for most people. So just to, to, in the interest of time, everyone, let's do it. Throw your guesses in the channel and let her rip. Oh, wow. 1860. 1860, 1983, 1992, 1901. Well, quite the range. Jim, 1995. Mike, 1977. See if anything else came in the Q or an A. Uh -uh. <laughs> well, David, do you see it? I do, actually. Well, it, it pays off to, to, to like, like, all of these game show questions, it's, it pays off to let everybody give their answers first and then you can bracket them, right? So Jim, you got it at 19, on the button, 1995. Congratulations, Jim. So oh, and, Tiana, Tiana just looked it up. Oh, October 11th, very precise. <laughs> uh, this year, well, congratulations, That's Jim. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm sure you have to dig for that one. Jim, we'll, I'll connect with you after and we'll coordinate that because I think you want a hoodie too. Gosh, you're having a good night, aren't you? All right. Well, with that, without further ado, you know what? I'm actually just going to do the Socratic method. And Jared, I'm going to call you up because you had listed a very good question. I'm going to invite you up to ask your question in person and promote you to a panelist. And then this way, David can see, uh, see the man himself who's been answering all the questions throughout the evening. So let's see. I think I did it. Panelist, there he is. All there right. Is. Yeah. Sure. I can. I can. I can join. Hey, oh. everyone. Hey, Jared. Hi, Jared. So you had a question that you wanted to ask David that you'd put into the. Oh yeah. So so I did have a question. I know. Uh, so with like the climate changing and everything, I think this is actually really great timing because we just were talking about the heat wave from a couple of weeks ago, um, and you see Bordeaux having a lot of heat waves too, and trying like as of recently allowing some new grapes into their uh, blends because of that, some more climate hardy grapes, heat hardy like Marcelon. So I was wondering if, if your estate was exploring other, other varietals that might be a little more hardy to uh, heat waves and kind of more warmer temps as, as the years go on. Um, well, because this little pocket where we're located was already the you know, Napa Valley is already one of the hottest growing regions in, you know, best known growing regions yep. in the world. I would say maybe Sierra Foothills or Lodi is hotter than here, but generally speaking, for premium grape growing regions, it's already pretty warm, known for warm climates. And we're a very warm microclimate within that. Um, Cabernet and Sauvignon Blanc are both pretty well suited yep. to the, the, the weather still, even with where we're at. And this year, frankly, you know, global warming is kind of a weird deal. It's like, this year was actually a very temperate year. Mm -hmm. There's so much talk about global warming. There was that one crazy week, but notwithstanding that one week, I would say the yeah. average temperatures this entire growing season were actually lower than they've been the 10 years I've been doing this. So- yeah. It's just, it's, there's a lot of weird weather. We saw a lot of uh, weird kind of humid days throughout the growing season at weird times. The last week we've had a lot of rain, which is very unusual. Yeah. Um, how global warming is manifesting itself is, is not just in yeah. higher temperatures. I think it's, it's more extremes, uh, higher swings from caught to cold, you know. Yeah, one of the things that's the biggest uh, concern for us is not the day highs, but the, the diurnal and the cool evening. Um, if you lose that diurnal, cool evening, warm day, um, weather temp pattern, that's really bad for the grapes. Yeah. Because if the weather stays warmer at night, it kind of stresses the vines out. Um, they're, they're happier. They like to go to bed every night. Yeah, yeah. And the Napa fog that rolls in from the bay is kind of famous for that. And yeah, and in August and September, we can see a full 50 degree temperature swing from the coolest temperature at night or in the early morning to the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, and and why I was asking is because there's a couple of studies showing that that fog is 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 starting to kind of go away and come in later in the year and and uh, stay for shorter amounts of time. So that that's kind of where. 
why I was asking the question. But yeah, no, it's it's good to hear that response because you know I, I do love Cabernet Sauvignon uh, in Marcelon, not as much. <laughs> well, great question, Jared. Uh, and thanks for all your participation today. Yeah. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. I'll all hop right, off I'm, video again. Yeah, I will uh, bring somebody else up. So Richard had a question as well. So Richard, let me bring you up to panelists. We'll do, David, are you okay to go just two minutes over if we do two more questions? Sure, sure. Okay, wonderful. And if anyone else has to drop off, then not a problem. We will send the video out, of course. Um, and thank you so much for joining. If you do leave us at eight, but let's see, I think Richard is just getting situated here. So Richard, you'll just have to take yourself off mute and turn on your video. There you are. Wonderful, hi. Hey, how are we doing? Hi there. So I have a qu question about your Cabernet Franc. Is it, uh, I think you have your phone on. Turn your phone on. Is it uh, green pepper or black pepper taste? Oh. I think Richard, you had your, your phone was uh, reverberating there, but I think uh, the question, David, was is your Cabernet Franc more in the green pepper uh, category or more on the black pepper side? How would you describe your Cabernet Franc? I would describe it as more green pepper herbaceous, definitely. Um, we do blend it with a touch of Cabernet Sauvignon, which kind of rounds it off just a little bit. Sometimes Cabernet Franc can be um, for some who are not Cabernet Franc lovers, a bit unapproachable. Our, our wine is, uh, it uh, still has that characteristic uh, angularity and uh, flavor, but it's, it's, it's rounded, the edges are rounded just a little bit with the Cabernet Sauvignon blended with it. So, so where do your Cab Franc grapes come from? The old Cab Franc vineyard that I mentioned at the back of the property. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Richard, for the question. Here, I'll move you back down. And then, just in the interest of time, I'm going to bring up one more person, Jim, our lucky tour winner, who also had a question. I'm going to bring you up, and then I'll just have a couple more questions that I saw pop up that we'll do rapid fire at the end. But let's just actually, while Jim is getting situated, just a quick question from Michael Are there any other single varietals planned, David? Uh, let me, how do I answer that? Um, we're going to expand our Pinot Noir program. We make a beautiful uh, Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir um, that comes from a vineyard called Spring Hill. I've, in recent years, I find myself actually drinking more Pinot Noir and more Burgundy than I do Bordeaux or Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and so it's something that I'm impassioned for. And uh, so we are actually looking to make Pinot Noir um, from uh, the San Lucia Highlands, which is mm. a great growing region in, in California down in the Carmel Salinas Valley area. Right. Well, Michael, stay tuned for that. And now here we have the man himself, Jim. Nice to see you. Thanks for as much so, so much for joining tonight. Congratulations. I'll let you ask your question. Thank you so much. It's great to see you again, Yula. And um, so my, my question was, of the, so you're at your 10 year vintage point. What so far is your favorite, vi by the way, I just wanna say before I finish my question, this is the first time I've ever tasted Senegal wines, which is why I joined the tasting because I never had the wines. I've seen my California Instagram friends post these wines and I knew about them, never had them. And so I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go. So I got all three I've tasted tonight, which has been fantastic. Uh, I'm back on the Sapelon because honestly, that's my favorite of the, of the night. I hate to say it, but um, my my question is, which is your favorite vintage so far that you produced in this kind of relatively short time frame, really, in the world of wine? It really is. Um, you know, it takes a long time to get established. I mean, you know, everybody here in the Valley says I'm still a newcomer and I've been at it for 10 years. Um, uh, you know, honestly, um, the answer is kind of qualified in that um, we've just, we are just simply just so much better at what we do now. Between my winemaker, Ryan Knoth, and I working closely together now for, for uh, seven years, um, to 
my being much smarter and, and more informed, making better decisions to us having a state-of-the-art winemaking facility that we didn't have for the first three vintages. Um, it's really, uh, you know, there's been a lot of variables that have influenced where we've landed. But in terms of vintages, um, I would say for Cabernet specifically, I thought the 2016 vintage was a very special vintage. And then I think the 2019 vintage is a very special vintage, which is our, our current release on our, on our cabs. Um, as far as the Pinot is concerned, I think our Pinot is definitely more influenced by us developing our craft over time more so. Uh, we did not make Cabernet when we started. So we started in 2017. The 2017 vintage, we actually didn't take that wine to, uh, to bottle because we were not satisfied with how uh, it turned out. We, we got into the, the Pinot business after a trip to uh, Burgundy, my winemaker and I, we had a chance to go to every first, you know, every first uh, growth, all the, the, the great uh, chateaus and the domains of, of Burgundy. And um, it was through that experience that we learned how to make Pinot. But um, now, so our Pinot, we're still in that cycle where we're, we're just getting so so dramatically better at what we do every year. And frankly, we're getting access to better and better fruit that our, our Pinots are just getting better and better. Wonderful. Well, I think uh, that's uh, that's something for us to all to look forward to getting more of the uh, the Cabernets and Sauvignons, but then also your Pinots is that seems to be a bit of a focus for you coming up. So Jim, thanks so much for the great question. I will send you back down. And then just before we sign off, David, I just want to give you a chance uh, and give everyone the chance to hear very quickly what you're sort of planning for the future. I know that you're involved in this new project, Details Wines. Do you want to just spend 30 seconds talking about that and sort of what's on the horizon for you with either project? Sure. Uh, Details is a new brand that we launched in um, 2018 with our, our Details Cabernet Sauvignon. It's uh, based in Sonoma. So uh, while our roots are in Napa, no pun intended, um, we recognize that with global warming and with rising fruit costs in Napa, really to make quality of the caliber that we wanted to make it and offer it at the value that we wanted to make it, we really needed to start considering alternate fruit sources to find that right quality value proposition. Because for many people, not the ones here on the call today, but for many folks, spending $100 on a bottle of wine is a lot of money. And so we think our $50 SRP Cabernet Sauvignon opens up a whole new audience, a broader audience, perhaps a younger audience to the great wine making uh, style of Senegal and gives them a kind of a, a onboarding path to some of our bigger, better, more prestigious wines. Wonderful. Well, I think that's definitely a wine for everybody on the call to have a look for details. I think you have both a Cabernet and a Sauvignon Blanc, correct? Those are the two that you have right now? Correct. Great. Okay. And then so that everybody knows, we will be sending around the video of this conversation and this tasting with David. It was so much fun. Uh, we'll be sending this around to everybody and we'll keep that link where you can still buy more of the wines if you would like. And we may have a little special offer for you in store as well. So stay tuned for more on that. But first, I just want to... Thank you, David, for spending the evening with us. I'm sorry that we went over a few minutes, but this was fun. We, I'm sure we could have asked you many, many more questions and gone for quite a while longer, but I uh, really appreciate your time. No worries. It's only five o'clock here. So it's, uh, I thank you all for taking the time and uh, staying, staying on the call a little bit later. And it was a pleasure to meet you. And uh, thank you for your thoughtful questions.